Good morning, everyone. It's Friday morning, and this is Gateway Open Office Hours. We here are here live on Facebook, just like we are every week. Me and Carter and our good friend Justin Lokitz from Business Models Inc. Uh, we're going to be talking today about designing a better business. If you missed us live, you can catch us on our podcast feed, Podbean. What is it? iTunes, Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, <laughs> something like that. YouTube, YouTube. You know, all the normal places. Yeah. All the above. All the above. All yeah. the above. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook feed, whatever. Just send us your questions so we can uh, ask Justin here and, and get to the bottom of them. Um, and Luke and Michael and PL and Carly, whoever's in the audience, uh, can just yell them out at us as they come in. All right, guys? Yes. And we're going to talk about designing a better business. And I'd like to brag about our awesome title that we're very creative. Yeah. We just basically stole from yeah, it's nice. I mean, Justin's book. So it's nice. hey, if it's it not works, if it's not broke, mm -hmm. sure. Don't face it. Is plagiarism one of the tools that you <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. When you need to employ plagiarism, you do. Isn't sure. Awesome. The, the greatest sure. form of flattery, right? Yeah. It's a, I'm flattered. Thank you. Guys. That's my defense. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, thank you so much for coming on. My today. pleasure. Good morning. Yeah. All right. I know you don't like to do news, but we should talk about a couple of news God. things quickly. Damn it. All right. Actually, can can people um, start letting us know if we should just stop the news? Because Ben really <laughs> wants to stop the news, and I, I'm kind of have mixed feelings about it. Twitter's exploding. It says stop. The news. <laughs> Twitter's exploding. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't talking to you, Michael. <laughs> Actually, there is there is some interesting news. I'll, I'll give it to you this this week. There there is some interesting news. Um, High Times was, quote, purchased, it was actually a controlling interest was purchased for $42 million, but it valued the company at $70 million, uh, by Damian Marley and even if it was just a cadre of badasses, I guess. I don't know. Okay. All right. Damian Marley? Not, yeah. not his brother Julian, but Damian. No. Okay. No. Oreva? Oreva Capital? I don't know how to say o that. O-R-E-V-A. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, that's cool. So well, I, $42 million, that's, I mean, that's a pretty big price tag for this industry, I think him. Well, you, it's 70 million price tag for the business. 42 right. million plunks down. That's pretty big. Yeah, yeah that's that's a lot. Uh, how much, what's the biggest exit we've seen so far? I don't remember. I don't know how much was like, uh, what did Privateer pay for some of their assets? I don't know. Oh man, nowhere, nowhere even close to that. I think mm -hmm. so. So it might be one of the biggest kind of valuations we've seen. Yeah. So congratulations to the High Times folks. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully they're changing the direction a little bit. Okay. Wow. All right. <laughs> um, also, Orlando. Yay, Orlando. You can walk into a dispensary today. Your first medical <laughs> dispensary is open, so uh, go get your medicine. So that's, that's the other piece I'm of news. I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, that has new meaning. Right? Oh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. What are you doing now that you won the Stanley <laughs> Cup Finals or whatever it is? Like, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to Disney World. Wink, wink. Yeah, with my pipe. <laughs> right. right. <Yeah. laughs> it's it's going to be a lot more fun than it used to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. I like that, actually. Um, maybe it makes Disney World more Attractive. fun for adults. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. I don't know how, how responsible it is it to be high while your kids take it. I don't Come think on. it is very high yeah. and responsible. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's super responsible. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay, great. It actually you can focus you out. on them. You yeah. Hopefully oh, not okay, yell at them, yeah. not be violent. Yeah. Could be That's, right. Right. That's right. If you need to smoke to not be violent to your children, please turn yourself into child protective services. <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Now that we're done with the PSAs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can get off the, the, the news. Uh, and now, could, so can you tell us a little bit about, um, so this book didn't come out of nowhere. My understanding is that it's kind of a open kimono to what you guys do. Yeah. Um, for as a business. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, your background and then what you sure. guys do? Sure, sure. So um, let's see, my, my background, I come from tech. Uh, I've been here in San Francisco, Silicon Valley for going on now 17 years uh, and worked for Oracle, a, a couple startups that eat, were acquired by other startups, were acquired by other startups, the big fish eats the little fish scenario. Mm -hmm. And then worked for Autodesk and did a lot of different roles, but eventually found myself in product strategy. Um, and really found, and this is kind of leads to where this book came from as well, really found that internal strategy lacks quite often. And most often that's because most companies and, and internal strategists, they don't know they need an aspirin or a Tylenol until they really right. need an aspirin or a Tylenol, yeah. Tylenol, right? And so by the time you get to the point that you're hiring someone to come in and help, you need a lot of help. Uh, and I struggled with this. Um, and so I left. 
I, uh, I uh, opened an office of a company called Business Models Inc., which is headquartered in the Netherlands. Um, the, my CEO was the producer of another book called Business Model Generation, where mm -hmm. the business model canvas came from. Yep. And, and a lot of this the lean startup and all these other things sort of came from that movement. Uh, and what we do is, is help companies co-create innovative business models and strategies for their future, all different kinds of companies. A couple of years ago, uh, after you know, Business Model Generation, some other books had been out there for a while. Um, Wiley, the publisher, came back to, to Patrick, my, mm -hmm. my CEO, and said, hey, it's time to write another book. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on out there, yeah. and we think that you could write a great book. And sort of he hemmed and hawed a little bit and thought, eh, I'm not sure I could do this. Um, sort of shortcut. I, I had come on board. I said, yeah, we could write a book. Let's, yeah. let's do this. I, I'm together. happy to help. Yeah. You know, I was originally the editor uh, yeah. and then was just writing. Uh, and we were writing and designing this book just like a software company writes and designs software in agile sprint modes. Hmm. Uh, and basically what we ended up coming up with was, hey, we have a lot of stuff inside of us to write this book, but it turns out there's tons of really great resources out there already, yeah. including the ones we already use at Business Models Inc., like Business Model Canvas, like Value Proposition Design, like Customer Journeys and things like that that are part of design. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, well it's not, it shouldn't just be us writing this this book because we think these things are great, but why don't we pull in all the other kinds of tools that are out there, all kinds of really Ashmore and, and others who've done some really great thing for startups um, with their own tools and methodologies and so forth. What if we pulled these things together and gave people a real toolbox, the tools, the skills, the mindsets to make change in their company or to steer their company or to ground their startup or whatever it might be. And that's what this is about. That's where it came from. So do you think, you know, what, well, what do you think that the main kind of difference is between the needs of a startup oh, yeah. uh, and the needs of, let's say, HP who wants to <laughs> pivot? Yeah. Or, or, or re, what's their latest thing? Invent or reinvent or some kind of, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of to reinvent themselves, right? Yeah. And they, they've done the big split now, and now both sides are trying to reinvent themselves. Right. Um, well, you know, I think there's a couple definitions. So there's the, the stalwart of, of Silicon Valley, Steve Blank. You know, his definition is a startup is not a, like a big company, uh, and that's because a big company executes, a startup is always in search of a sustainable business model. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest difference really between the two is that, in, you know, even in the reinvent myself for a big company, is that they have this business model that they're executing on that gets in the way. Right? And it's hard for them to reinvent because they know this one mode of doing things. They know this one mode of delivering value and capturing value, and they always want to go back to that. Uh, and that becomes often a weakness. And until they sort of break out of that and decide, no, we're going to create new businesses, and we need to figure out how to create new businesses and test those businesses like a startup would, mm -hmm. it becomes really hard. Sometimes that's the at the expense of what they're doing currently, like cannibalizing. Always be currently. cannibalizing, ABC, yep. right? <laughs> Always be cannibalizing. You see this from the best companies around. Every time Apple comes out, you know, whether you believe Apple is one of the best companies around or not, it doesn't matter. But, you know, you can see that on the charts. Every time now Apple comes out with a product, everyone goes, well, is that going to cannibalize the iPad sales? Is that going to cannibalize the mm -hmm. mini sales? And the answer is yes. And that's great, right? Uh, and with startups, you know, the opportunity they have and, and also the challenge is that often we see they're not encumbered by an executable business model, but that also means often they're in scramble mode, right? Continuous scramble mode. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before, even worse is when you're a startup and you're in continuous scramble mode and you're in stealth mode. And then you're doing nothing for anyone, right? And you are, yeah. And you have no feedback from the outside world at all. You have no feedback, you. right? And you wouldn't even know how to capture feedback if you did have feedback. So the, the other thing is, and we don't have to dig too deep in it because it's kind of a nuance of a large company, is like the staffing, right? It's like you have a, a sales team like of 30 people that are used to doing one thing. And like if all of a sudden you're going to change the business model up on them, it's like are they going to be out of a job? Like are they going to be doing something else? And in that kind of changing that moment of inertia is kind of, kind of much more difficult than in a startup, right? It, it can be. Um, interestingly, I think where, you know, what we've said in this book differs and also it's part of the lean startup movement and all these other sort of design movements. I think the difference with the way you think about strategy 
the way it should be done today anyways versus the way it's been done for a long time from you know giant sort of strategy firms and, and ma management consulting firms is that if you design the way you're going to create strategy as a team, co-created, then actually you, you can do that. And so you can remove this, you know, this idea that middle management is going to get in the way or salespeople are not going to like it. Mm -hmm. If you include sales teams in creating the new strategy, well, then you have a common shared language, a common shared strategy, the business models to support that. Uh, and everyone ends up moving in the same direction. Doesn't mean that yeah. there aren't people who want to block it, but you actually get people moving in the same direction versus if you deliver a strategy to someone, of course, what do you think they're gonna do? Especially if you're- If it threatens their current- If it threatens their yeah. current mode of yeah. working, right? And that's yeah. middle management you think about, that's the other challenge in big companies. You know, you can't fault them. Middle management is often employed just to meet the numbers mm -hmm. and you can't meet the numbers by looking at new ways of working, <laughs> you meet the numbers by looking at our current business model and executing against that, right? right. Mm. Yeah. So can we talk about startups a little bit more specifically yeah, sure. now? Because I think, uh, obviously, that's our focus. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I think, I'd love to hear your impression about this, but I think what, what we tend to see is a lot, of, uh, a lot of founders view strategy as this, like, Armchair, like I don't have time for that because they, they're like treading mm -hmm. water, sure. and sure. they're I feel trying like we to. We're guilty of that sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely, we're guilty of that. We sometimes. all are, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and so, uh, and I view what you're trying to do is kind of prove provide a, a toolbox to kind of help with some of the overwhelm mm -hmm. for strategy. Can you talk a little bit about what your experience has been with with startup founders and yeah. and how they can kind of approach this? Yeah, I think my uh, you know the approach with startup founders is giving them you know tools a process to ground themselves um you know we all anyone who's been in a startup maybe we all haven't been there but anyone who's been in a startup knows that you you know you throw everything out the window once you get going and once you start really sprinting towards something and you're sprinting towards a goal and you're you know and your money right your funding is is sprinting in a different direction you know what happens is you sort of everything goes out the window and you're just sprinting all the time. Putting out fires. And you're putting out fires constantly. Um, you know, so you can't fix everything. But I, you know, my approach and, and what we've done with lots of different startup founders is, yes, you know, this isn't going to a tool isn't going to fix your problems. But if you can take the time to use different tools and it's part of your sprinting process to ground yourself, to know where you've been, to not make the same mistakes, to understand what experiments you're running, which is really all that design and startups are about, is willingness to experiment and then understanding what those experiments have brought and what you've learned from them. If you can do that as a founder, you know, you actually save a lot of money, you save a lot of time and resources, and perhaps you pivot earlier, you have different insights earlier, than you would if you were just in scramble mode. And, and actually we've seen that, you know, there's empirical evidence that shows exactly that. Mm -hmm. If you're diligent about capturing where you've been, capturing the experiments that you're running right now, um, and under trying to do your best to understand what has happened in the market based on you testing things, well, you know, you, you'll have a better idea of what to do next. Sure. And that's difficult to prioritize, though, sometimes it, when, you, when you feel like you're fighting yes, fires. Is it this, does it have to be a super time-consuming thing, or is it something that once you kind of learn the tools, fits into your everyday? Y yeah, I think, I think what you said is exactly mm -hmm. right. Um, it should not be time-consuming. It, it should be a habit. Um, if you're already in the midst of running and sprinting full speed ahead, um, and your funding is is running out. Yeah, it, it's kind of late to start just using tools to try to fix something. <laughs> Although it's never too late to do something about it. But uh, you know what we've seen from the best startups, from the best founders we've uh, we've you know uh, met with and helped, and and many of which have now exited and and been doing are doing great things. Not all of which, but many of which have exited now. You know, what they've done is they've used tools like Business Model Canvas or Lean Startup Canvas or Lean Canvas or whatever those things are, but tools to, that are just now habitual, right? Every time they learn something, they were able to sort of see this visual of where they thought they were or their, their assumptions, their critical assumptions. They said, that's not right. Actually, it's this now. We just learned this new thing. And that changes everything for us. Let's try this now. 
Um, in fact, there's there's one in this book called One Tab. So there's a startup called One Tab, mm -hmm. uh, and analogous to in some ways to the cannabis industry. This was a a bar tab app. Mm. Uh, and oh, I think I remember One Tab. Yeah, they're 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 are in they Australia. They're in Australia. They are around, but they've actually uh, been acquired, okay. which is great. They were on this. They were on this tear, and they really just didn't know exactly where they were going. It was an app for bars. Okay, what does that mean? Um, and until they sort of not only got out of the building and started testing things, but also had ways to capture, you know, and quantify where they'd been and qualify where they'd been and and who were the you know, who were the customer segments and what value propositions really resonated and what partners did they really need in this business model. Mm -hmm. Until they really were able to qualify and quantify that. They were like every other sort of scrambling startup. But once they did, they sort of figured it out and it became just second nature. Like, okay, that's, this is our plan. This is the business model. This is the experiment we just ran. That worked, that didn't work. Let's update it next. And it was, you know, it's like a one minute a day exercise, five minute a day exercise. Sure, sure. What, what are some of the biggest challenges you see with getting you know, a, a, the early stage founders mm -hmm. face, but then B, in getting them to kind of adopt some of these tools. I, I think it's the, you know, it's the language. So, you know, it's a new language. A lot of these tools have a, a new different language than what you may be told you need to use. Um, yeah, you still may need to write business plans as a startup, right? And, and perhaps you do, depending on what kind of financing you're going to get, right? You may need a business plan and that, imbues in you some language that you're going to be using from a business plan and you're always thinking oh shit i gotta write a business plan right. <laughs> so the sometimes the biggest challenges are that what if you didn't write a business plan or what if you didn't think about business plans and you thought about you know a model to help you just understand and think about your business very quickly and don't worry about what the bank is telling you or what the, your vc or your accelerator or your angels are telling you mm -hmm. Use this, and the business plan will come. So a business methodology rather than a business plan. Yeah, that's right. Business methodology is a good way to say it. So you know, I think that's often a challenge. Is you know, is sort of the is the juxtaposition of what's been and, and how you know the the pull from you know maybe an investor or, or the bank or whoever they're getting funding from, and what they really just need to do to understand where their business is going or where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually a challenge. But then the other challenge is time, right? Again, you're in scramble mode. You're excited about your idea. Uh, you should be excited about your idea. And of course, you're out there pitching this idea all day. It becomes hard to sort of sit back for a moment and say, OK, what if I didn't pitch my idea, but I was open to observing what's mm -hmm. happening and, and what's going to happen with other ideas like this or my idea itself? before I go pitch it again? How could I learn to make this better? And that's a challenge because you're scrambling and you've got limited funding yeah. and time. I, I like the kind of whole concept that of like a mindset as a tool, Yeah, right? It's right. like, um, you know, something that you talk about a lot in here is kind of the customer journey and that kind of stuff. And, you know, as a, as a startup founder, we get so overburdened with our tasks and like sometimes we're just firing and just trying to get done what we thought was our priority list. Um, and sometimes if you just take, you know, five, 10 minutes back and, and reevaluate kind of the customer journey and see where those like pinch points are, it could re like completely reprioritize your list. And it's, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's hard really because there's like a weird, uh, <clears throat> there's almost two opposing forces, right? Because on the one hand, to be a founder, you have to have a very clear vision of what you think the world should yes. be like and what you think you want to do. Um, because if you just kind of approach it tabula rasa, you will go nowhere. Right. On the other hand, if you're pig-headed and that vision is written in stone, then you're not responding to any of the information that's coming to you, and that vision probably won't match what reality will pay you for. That's right. So yeah. it's this weird, like, constantly being in draft mode, listening to editors, uh, almost as a way of, of but, but, but pitching the draft. Yeah, um, that's right. That's right. Which I think is a hard mindset to be in, because it's this mix of two, two mindsets. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, the way the way we sum it up, and we're, you know, in many ways, our business models, Inc., uh, and we have this office in San Francisco, we're six people, um, you know, we think of it, we're also a startup, right? Uh, right. We are a, a small strategy company, we have 35 people worldwide, we're also a small strategy company, and we're up against big boys and big girls, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, we do something very different, um, but yeah, we think of ourselves as a startup, but you know, I think, 
what you're saying uh, is, yeah, you have to have this vision and you have to be able to take input. The way we think about it is, you know, at the center of everything is this point of view. And you, you've got to have a strong point of view, especially to be a startup founder. You can't go in kind of meek, like, yeah, maybe yeah, it's kind of neat. I don't know. <laughs> sure. No, that's not neat. It's kind of neat. You go in with a strong point of view, but you, you know, you basically inform that point of view by going out and understanding the world, the context, what's changing, your customers. You work with your team to continue to innovate and create new ideas that are informed by having now maybe you know gone out and looked at the world in a new in a new way. You take that information and informs your point of view, and maybe you do change a little bit. Maybe you add some extra words to test them out. But then you take those words and you go out and validate and prototype, and you do this loop, and it's on the front of our book too, this sort of double loop idea. And that point of view is, your vision's in there, but it's, it's, it's amenable, right? It's amendable, it's, you're, it's will, you're willing to change it a little bit based on the inputs you're getting based on your tests, and that's okay, that's your vision. You're like this malleable zealot. Yes. You're <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which is so, yeah. 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 I think that is a tough space to be in, it's honestly. It's tough. It's tough. <clears throat> uh, it, it is tough, but if your vision's big enough that, uh, you know, that it, it it doesn't have your app at the center of your vision or your, you know, whatever that solution is. Maybe it has the is, problem at the center. has the problem at the center, <clears throat> right? So if, if you're focused on the problem and not the solution, you're going to, go far, you know, and especially if you take the time and, of course, you have the proper resources and the, you know, network that you're making to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. So when, I, mean, I think I know the, the answer, but uh, maybe, 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 maybe it's, uh, maybe I'm wrong about what you're going to say. When should a founder kind of start learning these tools in their, I mean, is it before they even start or is it at some point in like do XYZ first and then start? worrying about the tools or yeah I of course it's of course it's when they start right um, you know one of the ways we've seen some of the best innovation and experimentation testing sort of sessions and workshops go uh, with startups especially is when you start doing the ideation you're creating the ideas even if you come in with an initial spark for something you know an app or or a community or some kind of you know double-sided business model like a Google or whatever it might be uh, platform if you take those initial ideas and you immediately start using tools to actually make them more concrete so you really understand what's underneath these so you really understand what you might go test next uh, rather than just coding something and throwing it up and, and hoping that something happens with it well, you're, you, you know, again, you're going to get empirical evidence back that tells you what you've been testing, that informs you about what pieces are which and how one thing is maybe better than another, whatever it might be. So sooner is better. And if you can do it as part of your idea creation, you know, even before you start experimenting and throwing things out there, well, you know, you're in a pretty good spot. And this doesn't cost <clears throat> a lot of resources on, on your end, right, to do as a founder. This is just, nope. you know you don't have to be building a lot of, you know, software tools or Nothing. spending ad dollars or anything. You can really be doing this on this and the super lean approach of just kind of I mean, one of the books yeah. that you even recommend, which is one of my favorite books that's not talked about, is The Mom Test. Yeah, Ron Mom Fitzpatrick. Test. Yeah. I don't know why it's not wildly popular, but it's it's like a super fast read. Yeah. And it's an awesome customer development book. Totally. Um yeah. but again, I, like Customer development is part of your, it fits into what you're, yeah. you're talking to people and, mm -hmm. and there's no, you don't have to spend money doing that. That's just. Uh, you do not, right. It's just legwork. It's, ju it's just legwork and if you think about customer development the same way you think about I I'm going to go experiment, I'm going to go put my, you know, my MVP or my alpha or my beta or my limited beta or whatever you want to call those things out there. If you use that also, not just to learn, but for customer, customer development, yeah, I mean. It's the same thing, you know. And when you're a startup, that really is the same thing. Those early, those early beta testers or alpha testers, as long as they're not your mom, right? As Rob <laughs> Fitzpatrick would say, as long as they're not your mom, right? They become your your customers. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Moore with you know the crossing the chasm was even as old as that book is. It's yeah, he's you know in many ways he's right. Like those early, early, early customers who are just they're willing to put up with so much bullshit. Uh, to to you know be the the champion of something new, mm -hmm. 
you can do that, right, and you use that, that opportunity not just to test and tweak and maybe to disappoint them sometimes, but also to create better customers out of them, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it can't go wrong. Can we can we walk through the cycle a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, in a very high level, I don't want to. You need a reference. There you go. Sure. <laughs> sure. Get into it. We should probably. I wish we could put one up on the screen, but we does probably it, can't. Does it make sense um, to hold it up? Yeah. Here, let me hold it up to a camera sure. really quickly so that people can just. This is the ghetto way of doing it. <laughs> give us this camera, Luke. Wrong other camera. <laughs> I can give you a bigger picture <laughs> of it in there if you want. Uh, it's not really focused well, but there's the cycle. There's like it's like a figure eight. Uh huh. Um, and the, because it's not focused, well, you probably can't see what these icons are. <laughs> but let's start. Where do we want to start? Do you want to start like up here, or where do? You, no, I would like to start in the middle. Right in the center. Okay. Start right in the center. So we'll start right in the center, and uh -huh. Justin will talk and yeah. Just remember that fuzzy picture. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Uh, and we'll we'll put a link to all this stuff below, so totally, totally. Uh, you, you can look at better better pictures. And, and by the way, all the tools in the book, like you know, you, you mentioned opening the kimono. We've made all the tools available in the book mm -hmm. on designabetterbusiness.com, right? This is not a, cool. a pitch for that. It's basically use it, you know, yeah, take no, it, use the tools, tools. use the tools, yeah. do what you need to do and give us feedback because we're in the same mode. Well, and I know a lot of the, the founders use the business model canvas. So like this would be the Oh, I've used the business model can yeah. canvas before. And in fact, my, and my, this is great. my first co-founder like printed up like a, a poster board that yeah. was laminated yeah. that we could like you know, write on and right. like erase. Awesome. And yeah. If you can't, I've got a little tear <laughs> of joy coming back. <laughs> so, so. Zoom in on that. Yeah. Zoom in on tear. Uh, <laughs> no, I, it's sort of what I described before. At the center of this thing is your point of view. You know, when we think about, you know, stepping back a little bit, um, we think about this idea of design and design a better business, but this design process. And what is design? You know, people say, well, do you mean like designing cooler, better looking things? Yes, and um, dot, dot, dot. Design is really this willingness to experiment, right? That's, that's, that's my definition for it. But I think when you look out there and see what design is, that is what design is. Whether you're designing things, you're designing websites, uh, you're designing businesses, cars, whatever it is, it's willingness to take something and, and a kernel of something, experiment and make it better in some way. Um, and, you know, in this example with this figure eight looking thing, we call it the double loop. Uh, why not put a new name on a sure. figure eight or infinity? <laughs> um, it's infinity, but on its side. On its side, right? So it's it's, totally, it's exactly it's right. Revolutionary. It's revolutionary. It's <laughs> revolutionary, indeed. But it's not an eight. Um, the idea is, you know, you don't just go out into the world with nothing like a blank slate that just doesn't happen mm -hmm. at the center of your being and especially as a startup founder again you have this strong point of view you've observed the world in some way and maybe it's your own world like i have noticed that these things are happening what if i did this right what if i what if i made this thing maybe it would help me how, how i think i can't is, ever find a cab in I, san francisco I, yeah this is a problem this is a problem yeah. right and so you start off with some strong point of view, and that is at the center of your being that perhaps becomes the, the, the first parts of your vision. But your very next step, and it doesn't have to be in this exact sequence, of course, but your very next step then should be uh, not let's go execute this vision, let's go execute this idea and just do it. Mm -hmm. Your very next step should be let's go observe the world and figure out, well, how does this, my strong point of view, jive with the world? Can I observe them? Could I ask some questions of the world, the context of what's going on. Maybe there's other things that are going on. Maybe there are trends, you know, especially we're here talking about the cannabis industry. What trends do I need to take, you know, to look at? Or, you know, what rules and regulations do I need to follow? But also technologies <laughs> and, uh, you know, and financial, uh, you know, and uh, um, environmental regulations, other competitors. How might I look at the world in a new way to, again, inform my point of view? I but think competitors is a huge one. I, I can't I tell you how many yeah. people come in and it's like, have you even looked at the competitive landscape? Like, this is not a unique idea. It's it's right. A, that's right. That's I have right. this problem. Turns out there's a solution. Just go Google that. That's <laughs> right. It, it happens all the time. <laughs> Top uh, six results. <laughs> it happens all the time, right? So you have to go out in the world and look at those things. And not just competitors, but all of these other things, right? Because you don't want to build an app for now. You want to build an app for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it really takes off, right? It becomes something new. Um, or an, not an app, whatever you're building. Right. Uh, if you can do that, and if you can go out and observe and understand the world, <clears throat> then you could maybe create new ideas, right? Uh, you, maybe you have still this kernel of an idea, you have a kernel of a point of view, 
um, inform it by, okay, what else could I do? How could I remix some other things that are out there? How could I remix my own thoughts? How could I bring in other people in my network or maybe I already have a team formed and maybe we're already doing something and now we're ready to start doing something else? Mm -hmm. How can I use that to ideate a little bit and, and or maybe a lot? And further inform my point of view by not just, you know, saying, okay, well, maybe my, it's just this direction or this direction, but no, there's lots of other ideas or options out there. And, you know, those two things at the top of that loop, they sort of expand your point of view. You write your visions now expanded in some way. Yeah. If you can take that then, and you can go out there and start prototyping, right? You start bringing things out into the world, uh, you know, and, and experimenting with them, well, now you've got this point of view, you've got this sort of kernel of an idea that maybe has been informed by observing, that's been, uh, you know, an understanding that's also now been informed by creating new ideas around it or maybe remixing things. Go prototype those things. And when you're, can pro we, yeah. Can we pause mm -hmm. really quick yeah. just on, on like regathering yourself and reinserting yourself into the, into those ideas? Totally. The, I mean, this is where companies yeah. are made and this is, you know, very critical. And I don't think a lot of first time founders really understand like, this is what makes your company unique because it's your job as the founder to make those decisions and decide that's right what you throw away what you keep that's right and just because you had this this brilliant idea in the beginning that 30 other people around the world have and are working right, on right right um, this part is what's going to differentiate you um, you know as far as what you create in the end right it's y like yeah that's right that's right i mean the the part that differentiates you is this willingness to continue to inform your point of view about what's going on and then testing that prototyping and validating which is sort of on the bottom of that little loop thing right prototyping and validating it and being willing to change right being willing to change based on the experiments doesn't mean you throw out this strong point of view you had but inform it right what direction do I need to? What direction do I need to go? And what decisions would I make now that I know what I know? Right? Mm -hmm. You started out with this really great idea that thirty peop other people had. You needed to make a decision as a, as a founder about what should I do now? Mm -hmm. And you know that's what this is all about. Yeah. All right. And <clears throat> part, let's talk about informing that idea a little mm -hmm. bit because um, part of that can be you know what should I build? Right. But part yeah. of that can also be. Um, is this is this really the problem that I think it is? Yeah. Right. Because a lot of times you jump to a conclusion about what the problem is, and when it turns out actually that's not exactly the problem, or not many people have that problem. But there's kind of this yeah. deeper problem that a lot of people have, yeah. and that's what I really need to be solving. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, I think that's. So I mentioned this. Uh, you know, I mentioned one tab before, and they, mm -hmm. they're in the book. But the, it's actually that's a, this is a really good example of that, which is. All too often, I've been part of the same startups, and I have, I am guilty of all these same things, right? Because we've all been there eventually. I think every, everyone is. Everyone's guilty of this, <laughs> so I can speak, uh, you know, I can speak from the heart here too. But, you know, this this uh, Scott, the CEO of OneTab, had this idea for this app. Uh, it was a bar tab app, and you know what he thought was this problem, which it it it, it is a problem, or it's not not a problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, double negative, but it is a problem, which is, you know, what he found, it's, he's an Australian, so, you know, he's going to bars, they're, you know, drinking Fosters or whatever they're drinking. <laughs> uh, um, and what he's Australian, he, uh, Australian with, to be with kangaroos, <laughs> with and, kangaroos. Uh, yeah. yeah, but, but he's, you know, he's, he's out there and he's like, you know, it take, takes forever to stand in line to pay for a beer or to buy a round of beers. And you're going to, you know, the same kind of bars we may go to. Uh, but they just speak with an, an accent, and they're drinking mostly Fosters and kangaroos a and kangaroos, obviously. Um, and so he's, you know, okay, let's build an app, let's go test this app, and and it, it'll be a bar tab app. Turns out, yeah, we have the problem, but it, is it really that big a deal? Maybe not, right? And if the bar doesn't support it, uh, or maybe is sort of halfway supports it, but no one's really behind this app, and at the same time, we can just go take out cash mm -hmm. or have a credit card and stand in line. And it you know it takes thirty extra seconds or a, even two minutes to get the beer or to pay for the beer. Mm -hmm. Do I really want to play with an app? Probably not. What he found, however, in his journey was that yeah, okay, it's a, it, there's a, a little bit of a problem there. The real problem are the servers in the bar and the bartenders, especially in a busy bar where they have actual servers in a cocktail lounge and they're going around. And what they deal with in their real lives is that. They're trying to turn over tables. They're trying to turn over the bar as fast as they can. They're trying to split checks 
mm-hmm. uh, in eight different ways with eight different modes of payment. Uh, they're being cheated all the time. And if they can't turn this over, it means they can't get a tip, right? Uh, can't get a faster tip. They also means they can't get the next tip or the next tip or the next tip, right? And so it turns out that the biggest problem uh, that Scott saw out there after observing and coming out with uh, you know, an app that did nothing for him was that, ah, it isn't the, the, the drinkers alone, right? Uh, it, it's the, the servers, it's the bar itself that actually has the problem. And so, you know, he iterated and changed the value proposition enough that it, and the business model as well, that now it's sort of two-sided. Yes, it's still drinkers want, may want the app because now maybe it's free, maybe it helps, maybe it's an expedited way to, expedited way to get something at the bar and, and maybe the bar even promotes it. Um, but it's really the servers who are benefiting. Uh, and then he went further and he kept doing it and trying it and trying it uh, and it still wasn't you know, really, really wasn't catching on until we found it was well, another part of this business model where the partners in this are the, the, the point of sale vendors, the, the POS vendors. Mm-hmm. They like this too, because if there's, if it's a cash bar, um, they don't always see where that money is going. They don't have the analytics behind what, what, how a bar oper- operates. If they, mm-hmm. if they don't see where things are going or who's using the, you know, who's using the POS or who's mm-hmm. even ordering drinks. And so they are, they don't have a lot of data on it, and the POS system is all about data. And so it wasn't until he sort of started taking this journey, and it, you know, he was using these same artifacts, these same tools, business model canvases, but really quickly. It wasn't about looking at them and spending hours. It was about, okay, I learned this, change this. You know, nightmare situation, change this. But he found that his real customers, you know, the top of that food chain were the servers. Uh, he found that the real partners were these these point of sale operators who now would get him to every bar in Australia and would also be on his side and would push this thing out and market the hell out of it because <laughs> they want it out there as well because it's real data for them. And at the at the very end, yeah, the drinkers would want it too because the bars are promoting it, the POS vendors are promoting it, and they're you know they're now the value proposition starts to make sense for them because it means they're going to get faster drinks or either able to pay quicker or, or whatever it might be, keep the night moving. That was the, the, you touched on something, uh, sorry, I, I want to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you touched <laughs> on something that I think a lot of uh, founders don't think about when they're thinking about their, their product <clears throat> or their idea, which is um, the importance of understanding the distribution model for like how that's going yeah. to get out and get rolled out. And there's this mindset like, oh, I can see the end person that would want to use it, right? And I don't, I don't know if this is exactly what happened with one tab, but I thought of it while you were explaining it. It was like, okay, yeah, but how are you going to get it into their hands? Because you got to go through the POS or you got to integrate yeah. with whatever. And like, if they don't want to do it, it doesn't matter how much the customer really wants it. Yeah, it's not right. going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's like understanding that whole the ecosystem. The ecosystem around mm-hmm. what you're trying to build because you could have mm-hmm. a great product, but if it can't get into the right That's hands, right. it doesn't matter. That's and right. Like, that is so important in the cannabis industry. Like there are definitely the gatekeepers to That's different right. parts of the business. And, yeah. Um, I, I just love the anecdote because I, you know, my late twenties, early thirties in San Francisco, I saw at least, you know, five of these companies launch and fail. And like every time, like I would, I, I was at a launch party for one of these apps and I talked to a bartender. He's like, yeah, I fucking hate it. And it was just like, Oh, well this company's dead. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're yeah. gone. They're gone. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so yeah they're, and they had their biggest competitor, you know, we put them in the book too because they launched and failed and mainly because they didn't try to figure out what that ecosystem looked like. And by the way, Scott, who this this the CEO, founder, no longer CEO, I guess he you know, was the founder of, um, of OneTab, he only found that ecosystem when he ran basically out of funding. Uh, and it was mm-hmm. because he went to uh, an investor and it said, we need investment to like get into every every bar in Australia and the investor said, I need you to show me the bars you're already in. I need you to show me revenue before I'm going to give you money because I don't even know if this is a real thing or not. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Scott's like, this is a nightmare. This is a, he was ready to fold. And that's when he came, you know, sort of fortuitously, this is also luck plays into every startup. Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, fortuitously, he ran into the POS vendors and that was his aha moment. That's where he drew the connection with the whole ecosystem. Now, of course, I think if he would have taken time to draw that ecosystem ahead of time, maybe he would have had something there, but maybe not, right? Maybe timing was part of that because they, 
The POS vendor also needed to see that he had thought through the value propositions for the other two uh, customers and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's, that's what pushed him through was that when he finally found that aha moment, the ecosystem looks like this, this is what I need to get into every single bar. This is how I need to get in every single hand of every, uh, you know, of, of every single patron of those bars. This is why they'd actually want it and need it. And this is how I'm going to make money off of this whole thing. Once he found that, that was gold. I mean, part of the, the word that keeps coming to mind is, uh, and it's a word that I often associate with design, which is, is empathy. Yeah. <clears throat> right? It's understanding like, okay, but from that bartender's perspective, how do they feel about yeah, this, right? right? And from the POS person's perspective, how do they feel about that's this? That's right. And, um, and I think that's, I don't know, I think it's something that's, it's easy as a founder to get you know, excited about the direction you're going and kind of ask questions. And ostensibly you have the information, but you, you're, not, you're not viewing it through empathetic you're eyes. And so it. you're, mm -hmm. yeah, you're kind of dismissing stuff. Well, they just don't get it, right? Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, we were just talking about the Silicon Valley show earlier, yeah, right? yeah, and it yeah, was like <laughs> that. That just uh -huh. came to mind. It was that uh -huh. uh, I don't remember. It was that kind of first version of Pied Piper app right, that right. came out, and <laughs> all my friends love like, it. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Uh -huh. but, but then they did uh -huh. the focus group, and he was like, his reaction to the focus group instead of listening was like, he's pitching. I'm going to go in and explain it to them. They just mm -hmm. don't get it, right? Mm -hmm. And it was like, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's this lack of empathy for someone else's perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I always viewed design as like this structured empathy, right? Yeah, I think like, that's a good way to view it, right? Structured empathy, right? This willingness to experiment, and that experiment includes being empathetic, going out there and listening to people, uh, you know, asking more questions than you, you know, than you're answering. Uh, tell me more, tell me more. Actually, you know, Rob Fitzpatrick, which we've mentioned here now a couple times with the mom test, great book, cheap book, awesome book. I mean, he goes right into that, which is here's some great questions to ask. Just ask them. But also, you're right, you, you can't, don't filter those based mm -hmm. on your own point of view. Let them fly, right? Or how they feel to you, right? Because there's a lot of like defensiveness that happens, yeah, right? Yeah, Which is like, that's right. I want to listen, but I'm triggered, to use a millennial phrase, there you go. Um, I'm triggered <laughs> yeah. by yeah. how I, this makes me feel. That's right. What was that, yeah. what was that indicating? Yeah. <laughs> you're a millennial. We've had this I'm conversation. I'm not a millennial. I'm just a millennial. <laughs> Are you somewhere in between? Seth Adler was just talking to Chris about this on his podcast. <laughs> right. I am Gen Y. Okay, okay. It is definitive. Calm down. It is different. <laughs> you're, a, you're a unique special snowflake. Calm down. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. It's that, um, cool. So do we, speaking of kind of listening to what you have to say, do we have questions from the beautifully designed studio audience? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Oh, you need to enable her mic probably again. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're on. You're good, and I think. So a lot of the entrepreneurs and startups, as you all are aware, um, we don't start with pro a professional strategist from the very beginning. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so our first instinct when, when we find that our sales are not where we think they should be or we're not getting the traction is to drop everything and scramble. Um, and I know you spoke about sort of staying on target. So uh, what I'm interested in knowing a bit more about is how we stay on target, move just a little bit without dropping everything and scrambling. Yeah, I, I think that's tough, right? Especially if, you know, it's the fight or flight mode, right? Um, the staying on target, I, I really do think comes to taking time to ground yourself, figure out, you know, what is it that's strong in our current approach, our business model, you know, we do this with all kinds of clients, but mm -hmm. you know, what, what makes our current approach, our current business model, and maybe our strategy or our value proposition or whatever those things are that we're, you know, that we're chasing at the moment, what are the strengths and what are its weaknesses? Um, because that's what you're talking about, which is if something's not working. Um, do I need to figure out what's un underneath that thing that's not working, which is you, you have to take time to do that doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, you could take a couple hours. Now, not all of us have a couple hours. We, maybe we really are in emergency mode and we, we can't find that time. But somehow you have to find the time and the rigor to figure out what is it that, I'm, that I've been after? How can I make this more concrete? And maybe even sort of, um, you know, sort of explode it a little bit to figure out what are all the elements that I'm working with? 
what have I found that's really strong in this? What have I found that's really weak in this? And how can I then make the weak parts stronger or use the strengths to create something new? And again, I think that does come back to tools. You, you don't need a professional strategy person to do that, but it is about sort of grounding yourself and, and using tools and processes and a mindset to do that uh, to, to really figure out what's next. And then I wonder if your book could be a great template or model for entrepreneurs um, you know, until we get to the position that we're able to sort of hire a strategist to come in. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's that's the idea behind it. It's a, in many ways. Well, you know, I can't say it's open source because you do have to buy the book, uh, <laughs> unless you're. We can give it to you if you it's, come you across. You can come borrow from it's me. It's pretty if you want. close to open source. <laughs> it's pretty close to open source. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's as close as you can get. And nah, maybe not as close as you can get. But anyways, uh, yeah. It's the idea is it can guide you. Um, in fact, at the very, very front, we have this thing called fast passes, which is, I just need to know the answer to this right now. I need a strategy, or I need a business model, or I need to know how to create and test a value proposition now. And we sort of tell you, yeah, go to this page, then this page, and then this page, right? And, and you'll get some of that information right away. Don't read the book end to end. Open it to these pages, and that'll give you an idea of what to do next. Yeah. And then I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the work that you're doing sort of with entrepreneurs in the cannabis space. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've done some personal work, even in my current role, I've done some personal work with, uh, with a couple startups in, this, in the cannabis space. Um, one is sort of um, still trying to find its, its feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the same founder of that one uh, is also actually working with a couple other startups. He's, uh, he's been a chef before. Uh, he's also a designer. I went to school with him. So, you know, we've been sort of working together here and there really to help also ground him. Like, okay, what other directions could you take? What have you done now? In many ways, it's more like counseling. <laughs> uh, you know, when we work with startups, often enough, and this is because we, we love working with startups, uh, we make our money from big companies, but that the excitement comes often from startups. I'm, I'm actually almost always open to give any startup a couple hours, no problem, any day of the week, all, to all day long, right? Obviously not every day, all day, but a couple hours here and there is no problem. And so the work that we've done with startups specifically in the cannabis space, and this is me giving time to them, is, yeah, okay, let me help you ground yourself. Let me help you think through this problem or this uh, your opportunity. Let's do some ecosystem modeling to really figure out what's behind this thing. Uh, let's figure out, you know, well, you, this is your business model. Have you thought about these things and sort of poking holes in it and figuring out how we can make those weaknesses strengths? Um, so, yeah, those, you know, that's that's some of what we've done. So, just to be clear, because mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that was this was clear from our earlier conversation. This isn't just about tech companies, oh, right? No. I mean, this can be applied to. Well, you're talking about an edibles company or a potential edibles company, right? That's right. Um, yeah. And so this isn't just a, a tech business model approach. This is I'm actually going to kind of any take business. this a step further. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Tell me if I shouldn't. Um, Go ahead. It's not even necessarily just for business. Um, I think like this a lot about my life mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. as being a founder, you know, every minute that you can extract from your day to day and insert it into your business is, is valuable. And so like oftentimes, especially like, you know, on the weekend or something, I'll, I'll just kind of evaluate and like see what are my like daily stresses and, and what can I uh, design in a better fashion like around just the day to day. And like if, you know, there was a point in time where I was stressed about, you know, my phone running out of battery or something like that and like having to find my charger. So I just went on Amazon, I bought 10 chargers and plugged them in all over my house. And then it's just like, <laughs> you know, it's like I never had that stress anymore. Yeah, sure. You know, it's like, you know, just little things like that. And if you, if you kind of like, gamify your life a little bit, you can actually totally. free up a lot of time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, and I like that you guys use these strategies to write the book. Yeah, well, yeah, which is we like did. This, this beautiful yeah, we did. kind of uh, recursion. We, we did. Sense. We decided to write this book, and it's in the back of the book, the story about it was, uh, so the publisher gave us a month. That's not it's barely possible uh, unless you're they one. They give you a month a to month do what? To write the book. No Holy way. shit. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and I don't remember the reasoning behind that, but a lot of it had to do with um, we wanted to do this book in a very different way than, than the publisher had ever done a book before, which meant we wanted to design every single thing 
We wanted to do all the layout ourselves. We didn't want them to be involved in that at all. We wanted it to be in total color. We wanted it to be a you know uh, an aspect ratio like you know size a very specific size. They're like, yeah, it can't be done. We're like, well, it will be done, and you've done it, and we're going to do it again. And they said, okay, now you have a month. I see. So that was like they're you threw down the gauntlet, kind and they threw it back. Yeah, they were like, fine, do it in a month. They said, yeah. fine, yeah, we're all in. <laughs> Show your card. So eventually, we turned it into three months, a hundred days. Uh, so we, they were like, okay, we'll give you a hundred days. Uh, this is, I mean, this is a lot. That's of a lot of work to do. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it was beautiful. It was, it was awesome to do. Thank you. Yeah. There's some, there's some Easter eggs in there, right? There's still some, some typos and things like that in there, which is fine. Uh, it's you know it's a prototype. As long uh, as it's not Kofifi, right? Right, it's not Kofifi, right? Uh, there's, you won't find that in the book. Um, you know, Kofifi turned out to be an Easter egg, right? That's, uh, right, that's right. The, the rumor. Is right. Like, yeah, I don't know. If sure. It's true. Why not? Um, but yeah, we we did it in a hundred days, and we did it exactly using the same process. Uh, you know, we which meant what you know we didn't know what we were going to do to begin with, so we just started testing things, and it took us basically the first week took us, uh, you know, that entire week, 16 hours a day, to come out with a prototype chapter, which was horrible, which was absolute shit, right? But we're like, <laughs> we got to finish one thing in a week. And by the last week, and we did it all in Amsterdam, and that's why I'd fly over there every few weeks. Um, the very last week, we did seven chapters all in that same week, and that were all sort of gold. Like, they basically wow. needed very little. And it's not because I'm a great writer or because my designers are great designers. I think I'm a good writer, and they're incredible designers. It's because we had this, we now knew you what we were- nailed that process. We nailed yeah. the process. We knew exactly what we were doing. We knew what value proposition we were there to address, and we just did it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so 100 days, a full book can be done and it was a team effort obviously and you see all the people on the cover it's not just one person it mm -hmm. took a team to do that yeah. yeah it was fun that's pretty awesome yeah um any other uh, we're just about out of time but any other uh questions from uh from you princessa or anyone else that we need to address no cool all right all righty right. well thank you very much for for joining yeah, us thanks yeah. for having me it's yeah, pretty fun conversation and yeah and uh, love what you're doing. So. Thanks so much. Yeah, love what you guys are doing too. And uh, great. what are the best way for people to get a, get a hold of you? Uh, so you can get a hold of us uh, in a couple different ways. Of course, you can go to businessmodelsinc.com. You can also go to designabitterbusiness.com. Uh, you know, uh, our Twitter handle for both, you can go to uh, how2dbb. Uh, so that's H-O-W-2-T-O-D-B-B. Uh, is our is the Twitter handle for the book, or you can go to bizmod uh, Inc. Yeah, bizmod Inc. USA, uh, or my own Twitter handle, which is J M is in Michael L O K I T Z. Uh, J M Lokit. Yeah, and cool. so yeah. by all means, hit up any one of those. You'll find us somehow. Lots Great. of ways to contact you. Lots <laughs> of ways. <laughs> Thank you again. Yeah. This was a delightful conversation. Uh, time ran away from us, as Pretty seems to happen a lot yeah, lately, sure. I guess. But. Uh, Awesome. So cool. thank, yeah. thanks everyone for joining. Thank uh, come back next week at 10 a.m. for live Facebook video feeds. Go to all the places that we said at the beginning of the show, like YouTube, Mostly and YouTube. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, uh, yeah, go subscribe to YouTube. Do something. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next Help week. Help us get our vanity URL. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Bye, all.